Welcome to Mindfulness Manufacturing. My name is Trevor Blondiel. Spending 25 years in manufacturing, I discovered the real impact we have on turnover, communication, and the ability to manage change is how we show up. That's the essence of emotional intelligence. In each episode, we bring a guest or message to expand your skills, engage your people, and grow your organization. So let's jump in. I had a leader in our manufacturing space walk into a coaching session this morning. When he walked in, his approach was just different. He had this smile and this aura to him. And I usually ask the question, hey, what's been going on since we last met? And I could just tell something was different. And he talked about some meetings he had with his team and how they were more engaged and how he was a little more passionate. And then later, when he went to one of the management meetings and reported out, it was a little different because he got less questions and just seemed more comfortable. And I said, well, what is different, man? What's going on? And in one word, he said, confident. And I have today, Tracy Hooper, who wrote the playbook on confidence, the now hello, what to say, what to do in the world of work. And she answers the big question, how do you carry yourself with confidence now? Or maybe in, ne in the next 30 minutes on this podcast, she's got a background in TV to tell real life stories because we like stories on this show and how to elevate your personal and professional presence and build confidence. Tracy, you've worked in manufacturing with clients and, and in your work. Where do we start? <laughs> Where do we start? We'll start right here, Trevor. You ready? <laughs> ready. Here's the big myth to be busted about confidence. People think that you're born confident, that you're born with a type A personality, that you just have a big personality and that's why you're confident. But the reality is there is a part of confidence that's in our genes, that's a part of the personality we were born with, but the rest of it comes from taking action. Take action, make mistakes, adjust, refine, and repeat over and over. Confidence can be learned. That's the big takeaway. Sounds like manufacturing. We have plan, do, check, act. Kind of. Like, yes. So there's a process for confidence as well. That's good to know. Yes, it's indeed. something that I can still work on. And I think a lot of our, our listeners can. So where, where does someone start practicing with this, Tracy? Well, today we're going to talk about confident conversations because everyone is slightly rusty. <laughs> Many of your uh, listeners, I'm sure, have been in the trenches during COVID, before, during, and after. But a lot of people who have been living in the world, haven't been to networking events, haven't been to industry conferences, haven't been to big meetings, and they may be slightly uncomfortable having conversations. If we're going to talk about that, one of the best ways you can start to have a confident conversation is by beginning with a compliment. Give someone a compliment. I have a, a friend who spent a career, a long career at HBO, and, and he said he never compliments people on what they're wearing or what they look like. He would never say, great haircut, like your goatee, cool sweater, no, he always compliments people on their traits or on an accomplishment. So it could be, Trevor, congratulations on your podcast. I listened to the last episode and it was really helpful. That's an authentic compliment on an achievement that you had. It could be, uh, Jill, I really respect what a team player you are. I always know I can come to you and we can solve a problem together. That's an authentic compliment. Mm. That being said, if you know someone well, if you have a relationship with them, you can certainly say, Trevor, I love your, I love your hoodie. <laughs> it's a really <laughs> cool color. You know, you could, you could still say that based on where the relationship's at. That's correct. But that's the number one way that you can start a compliment, that you can start a conversation with someone. When you give them a compliment, it makes them feel good. It elevates them and it can get the conversation started in a positive way. I've never heard that before. And I've done that to someone that I've just met saying, hey, I really like your, your colors on your shirt. But when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking the shirt doesn't represent who I am, my behaviors do. Is that part of an identity? You know, I think that this gentleman um, at HBO was sensitive to not coming on too strong or too personal for people. Mm -hmm. And that's why he focused on their traits or their accomplishments. That said, I have a very good friend who died at age 89. Her name was Miriam Thornburg. And she said to me one time, if you can't think of something to say to someone, tell them 
I like your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and I do a lot of work with um, Nike is one of my clients. And I'm very happy to say someone, if I see them on campus, I like your shoes. <laughs> it depends on the relationship. I think you need to make that decision when you're in the moment. That's one of the ways to start a conversation. Another way to keep it going is to use what I call the magic words. Magic words. Yep. The magic words that can lead to Kickstarter questions. A magic word is what? What's the most important part of your job? What do you find you're most challenged by? What's the biggest change with supply chain issues? How mm. is another word? How did you get to learn your skill? How do you recommend I go forward with this project? How did you, how did you come to that decision? And then tell me more. When you say, tell me mm. more, it opens up the world for people. It's not a yes or no answer that you'll get, but it opens up for them to expand on it. And if someone says, tell me more, it means they're really listening to you. And that makes a big difference in a, in a confident conversation. It, it, that's a secret one because you can even not even totally understand exactly where the person's coming from. And you just say, tell me more. And it kind of buys you, it goes a little bit deeper. So you can respond confidently. Tell me more. So you don't it's, use the, you don't start your sentences with the word why. No, because that can make <laughs> people feel defensive. Why haven't you done that in your division? Why, why is this a problem in your department? No, tell me more. Tell me about this concern you're having in your department. Tell me what, what is the holdup in in this part of the manufacturing plant? Much more, it's open-ended. It makes people feel good that they have a chance to expand and explain themselves. Manufacturing, it may not be because we were more remote. I believe that we just get into old habits mm. and we get lazy with our words, as our friend Patricia Fripp talked about on a previous episode. And just that energy of that, how, tell me more, that, that can just, that can separate you as a leader. Absolutely. Most people, Trevor, want to be heard. Even if they know you're going to disagree, if you're going to say something that they know they don't believe in, or they don't trust, or they don't want to try, if they feel heard, it makes them want to have the conversation. Then you can find out, you know, where you share interests or beliefs or techniques and then take it from there which brings me to the next the next way to help people to connect uh, and be have a confident conversation is to practice the art of listening Larry King the talk show host for 50 years <laughs> who conducted something like 50,000 interviews in his career said this about listening. I never learned anything while I was talking. How true. Yet we like to hear the sound of our own voice. <laughs> we like to hear the sound of our own voice. We like to feel like people care about what we're talking about. And Barbara Walters said one time, another icon in the, in the uh, interviewing industry, in the media industry said, it's not the first question that you ask that matters. It's the second. Mm. Because the second question shows that you're really listening to the person. If you if you ask that second question, it's playing off of the answer to the first one. I love that. Do you think, Tracy, that sometimes we want to say more and ask less questions because we believe that's going to show more confidence? Mm, very. Oh, that's a great question. I believe we talk more when we're nervous. We talk more when we're trying to preen and act like we know it all. We talk more when we're not confident because we feel like if we say more, Maybe something I'll say will land, <laughs> will stick. <laughs> and in reality, I, I tell people when you're having a conversation to practice what I call three sentences and a period. Okay. Say three sentences and then stop talking and say to the other person, what do you think? What's your perspective? What's your take? I'd appreciate your opinion. And that mm. way you have that mutual conversation. It's not a monologue, but it's a conversation one person to another. Three sentences in a period. I, I can use that one. I, I was just telling a story to a colleague and she obviously cares about me because after I was telling the story and she said, you know, if you would have stopped the story here, you had me. And then you kept on talking and then you lost me. And I'm like, oh my goodness. I, I thought like I was, you know, doing a better job because I gave maybe six or eight sentences, but like how, how, 
how do we know when we're losing someone or just that? Is it the three sentence rule? Yeah, well, that's not hard and fast. Of course, if you're having a conversation, you might say more, you might say less and same for the other person. I think the important thing is to look at body language. Is the person starting to fidget? Are they looking away? Are they yawning? Are they folding their arms in front of them? These are all those nonverbal cues that let people know that we're not making an impact or it's time to stop talking. I think for people who who may talk too much and they've gotten some feedback that they have, the three sentences in a period is a good starting point. And then as you begin to get more comfortable with how you present yourself, then you can expand it if the conversation leads that way. And a lot of us want to know, like, how do I increase my confidence now and, and have that greater impact? So what where are the improvements that you're seeing? Like if someone is in that state of, I think I'm confident, but I, people just aren't seeing it in me. And you say, man, this area, when people start doing this, I see a big impact. What would be one of your areas that you see that? Mm, I'll give you a great story about that. One of my yeah. clients called me one time and he said, Tracy, I have good news and bad news. <laughs> I said, great. What's the good news? <laughs> he said, the good news is I've been promoted. I said, fabulous. What's the bad news? He said, the bad news is I'm an introvert and I don't really like people. And now I'm in charge of 307 of them. <laughs> and we both laughed because of course, being a leader of whether you have a team of five or 307 is an opportunity for you to come out of your shell. And there are many leaders who are introverted or who see themselves as reserved, but they still want to connect with people. And my recommendation to him was to use the what, how, and tell me more. Because once you begin to ask those magic words, then you begin to have real conversations with people, that natural back and forth of, of exchanging information or finding out how someone feels about a project or what their frustrations are. And then once they begin to know that you listen to them, you've asked those leading questions, you've listened to them, now you're beginning to build trust. Mm. And when you begin to build trust, then people will call on you more. They'll ask for your support. They'll want to interview you. They may want to hire you. They may want to promote you. They may want to recommend you. They may want to be a mentor for you. It's that relationship that happens over time that if you begin with the small ways of having these conversations where you're asking open-ended questions, that can really open up your world. And confidence, confidence is learned over time. Mm -hmm. I ended up working with that client for off and on for four years. And he would come to me with an issue. We would have a lot of role play around it, even though we met virtually. And that gave him the confidence to have those difficult conversations or to have a challenging conversation with someone else. It takes practice. It takes practice and that vulnerability of saying, hey, I could get better at this and, and just be able to say that I, I'm not feeling that confidence. And But the, the glow on this individual's face today was like, oh man, so that's what it looks like when mm -hmm. you gain confidence. Mm -hmm. And in my questioning with him, it was really some of his taking some chances of you know, opening up more dialogue with his team. And any suggestions on on that way as if you are maybe an introverted leader and to get your team talking more in a group setting? Well, I would start one-on-one. -on -one. I bet you mm. that leader you talked to started having one-on-one -on -one conversations with his team. Then you can have two-on-one -on -one conversations. Then you can, you know, you can build it from there. The other way is to make people feel included. So if you're in a meeting and you're leading the meeting, you could say, uh, Joanne, you started talking about this idea. Keep going with that. Let me hear more about that. You don't really have to say that much to get people to talk. If you bring them in that way, or Leo, I remember that good idea you brought to me last week. Tell the group about that. Mm. You hear that? Tell the group. Tell me more. Tell us all about that. And that way people have a chance to shine then they feel good, then they want to be a part of the team, and then the team becomes more. Um, it's such a, 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 a secret in the fact of to speak confidently, you actually need to have the confidence to let others speak. Mm, great point. Excellent. And, but like you, you mentioned, we get stuck in these routines of, of telling. And I was talking to one leader in manufacturing was going to help another leader in manufacturing, another plant, which was really struggling. He's like, Trevor, I've told, every time I go in there, I tell them what they need to do. 
you know, and I tell them the technical solution and they, they just don't seem to do it. And I'm like, well, maybe we need to take a different approach. Right. <laughs> and, and for that leader to say to another leader, I've noticed that we have this conversation on a regular basis about what needs to be done. Would you be open to some feedback about how I might be able to help you uh, break the pattern? Mm -hmm. Would you be open? And I noticed, you know, I statements are really powerful, especially when you're having a difficult conversation, because people would people would rather walk over hot coals than give someone feedback <laughs> or, or tell them something they know they don't want to hear. But you, you can say, I've noticed that mm -hmm. every time I'm in the shop, there's an area that continues to be unsafe because of mm -hmm. something on the floor or something that's hanging out of a shelf. And I'm concerned about that because we have a really good safety record and I want to keep it that way. What are your thoughts? And then you give the other person a chance to talk about it. Well, I never have enough time to clean up at the end of the day. And yeah. It's a really messy office anyway. It doesn't matter. The plant doesn't matter. We have people who clean once a week or whatever their excuse is. And then you can say, I hear you. I hear you. It is, it is, there is a lot of debris on the floor. And then can we make a, can we make an agreement that from now on, et cetera, et cetera. But those I statements are really helpful to keep people from feeling defensive. The other technique is to ask your family member or a friend if you could mm. practice having a good conversation. And if you're really brave, <laughs> you can ask them if you can record a conversation. Say, I want to improve my communication skills. I want to become a more confident conversationalist. And could we, and then you can talk about anything. Could we record mm -hmm. talking about our favorite vacation or, you know, what we're hoping to do over the holidays? or my, the favorite part of my job, or let's compare notes about our favorite sport or our favorite football game. And then you can have a normal conversation and you can hear how it, if it is a back and forth, and then you can practice from there. That would be a really great friend. <laughs> you, you talk about being brief and the power of that. And I find that when I do listen sometimes to my own podcast recording, it's like, oh my gosh, Trevor, you threw in some dead wood words in there and you certainly could have cut that. Uh, what is this power of being brief? Oh, well, we're all so distracted these days. There's a notification, there's a ping, there's a phone ringing, there's the doorbell ringing, it's the dog barking, it's 24 seven news coverage. And our attention span has gotten a lot shorter. So to really get people's attention, we need to be brief. We need to say what we need to say and trust that we'll be able to get all the information across and heard in a, you know, by the other person. I was talking to someone not long ago and the person said to me, I feel like I need to talk really fast because people don't listen after a certain period of time. And I looked at that person <laughs> and I said, here's the trick, practice the power of pause. You don't need to fill up every second of a conversation with sound. Practice the power of pause. Mm. And when you do that, it not only gives you a chance to gather your thoughts, but it gives the listener a chance to process what you've just said or get ready for something interesting that you're going to say. Another skill. Oh, okay. So the, you're probably listening to this while you're driving. So we will have some great show notes because we've <laughs> already got a whole... Uh, pad of paper filled with uh, ideas here on what we could maybe do a little bit different. And I love the fact that we focus on what, you know, what can you do different instead of just looking at other people and, and how much they're talking. But I can see how, if you can say what you need to say and be more brief, that does breed confidence, right? Because I don't have to repeat myself because people feel when someone says something two or three times, the same thing to me, I'm kind of like, okay, what kind of message are you sending me right now? And that makes me think, do I do that too? Yeah. And try to think about that. So when, you, when we're on the manufacturing floor and, and you're a leader, you want to stop, you want to talk to people. And sometimes you know this, if you're listening, that you may not talk to someone because you're afraid that they might get into a really long conversation and you don't know how to politely tighten that up. How do we do that with confidence and not make the other person feel odd? I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> because we've all been in that situation, whether it's on the manufacturing floor, whether it's at your high school reunion, <laughs> when it's, you know, leaving church on Sunday, you're at an industry conference and the guy who talks too much, you just want to run in the other direction. Uh -huh. This is what you say if you're on the manufacturing floor. Joe, 
I have a couple of minutes before I need to go over to the other side of the floor. Tell me the one issue you think I should know about. Now you've set a time frame for Joe. He knows he has two minutes. And if he keeps going, you can say, Joe, I'd love to hear more, but I need to get to that other meeting. Can you tell me in a couple of words what you need from me? Well, what I really need for you to do is et cetera, et cetera. And it's setting a boundary. It's letting people know ahead of time so that you're not cutting them off. And, and it makes them feel good. You're taking the time to talk to them because trust me, if you're avoiding Joe, so other people are too. Everybody mm. knows he's an over talker. <laughs> And poor that's Joe. poor Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and Joe doesn't know it. But I love the boundary and the fact of, hey, you may be able to separate yourself as a leader because you do connect with that person. You just make it more clear to, 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 because how many times do we have in manufacturing someone that has a great idea to improve our process and our quality or our safety? But we just don't take the time to have the conversation because we're afraid how long it's going to take. Mm -hmm. And then there's so much noise that we don't even get the point out. I love the boundaries. And if you got one important thing to tell me today, Joe, what is it? Exactly. And it or, could be you, or you could say, Joe, I'm, I'm uh, polling 10 people on the floor today and everybody gets a minute to tell me one idea they think would be a game changer for our company. Go. Now Ooh. Joe's psyched. He knows he's one of 10 people who've been quote unquote selected. He has one minute. And if it's a good idea, you can say, Joe, that's interesting. Follow up with an email and great to see you. There's some exit lines. I have a whole chapter in my book called The Now Goodbye. Oh my <laughs> now, gosh. How do you exit a conversation with confidence? Because that's the hard part. If you need to move around the manufacturing floor, you need to be able to move on with confidence. So you could say something like, I have, tell me one good idea. Great. Follow up with an email or um, I need to go see Trevor before I leave this morning, or I have a meeting that's coming up. Thanks very much for the conversation. You know, an exit, a, a confident exit has a four, has four parts to it. It's thank you, acknowledge someone for what they've said, provide some kind of an exit line, and then, and then a, a gesture of, a, 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 you know, a handshake. If you've shaken mm. hands, if you're comfortable yeah. with that, a high five, a fist bump, or a wave, whatever you're comfortable with, but it would be something like this. Trevor, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you very much for noticing how important it is to set boundaries. I appreciate you bringing that up. You know, I need to go because we had set aside 30 minutes for this call. So I'm going to be mindful of our time, but it was great to see you. Take care. And then you leave. You see the four parts, the, yeah. the thank you for the conversation, the acknowledging, because when you acknowledge what someone says, it makes them feel like they were heard. Mm -hmm. Thank you for talking about setting boundaries. And then your farewell line, their farewell, farewell phrase. I have a meeting I need to get to. We promised 30 minutes. We're almost up at the hour. And then the gesture could be a handshake. Great to see you again. Whew. It se seems so elegant when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the other piece. This is all about practice, everybody. Practice, practice the yeah. way you are good at your job is because you have been practicing it. Doctors mm -hmm. practice medicine. Lawyers practice the law. They're in practice. That's the expression. And we're doing the same thing. And I always tell people, give yourself one skill you want to work on for 30 days. Psychologists tell us it takes us 30 days to form a good habit or to break a bad one. If you want to practice getting out of conversations, Practice one line that works for you, the four-step process with that one exit line. And for 30 days, you'll get better. Mm -hmm. what, what do they say? Practice makes progress. <laughs> now, yeah, we, we don't need to be perfect, but we, we need to get pra practice if we want to get better. And it resonates with me when you said, I, I, I'm kind of pushing you for what's, what's the secret? What's the simple trick to just to have more confidence? And Part of it is what you just nailed, and it kind of set me back to think it's those one-on-one -on -one conversations. And, and when you get back into that group setting, you've got that relationship built, and your confidence is better, and you can pull questions out. Whew, I can feel that connection, but we got to do the work, and we got to do the practice. So many different areas we, we could, if, there, if there's one area, Tracy, that you have seen in manufacturing that you said, man, if we could just practice this aspect more this is the one that you personally would like to see practiced more. 
what which one would that be? This may surprise you, Trevor. The one practice I would encourage you all to be mindful of every day is to look people in the eye. Look people in the eye. And if it's tricky for you to look someone in the eye, look at the bridge of their nose. <laughs> it's a wow. great fake because yeah. when you look someone in the eye, it's your nonverbal way of saying, you matter to me. I care about what you think. I may disagree with you, but I respect you as a person or as a colleague or as a boss. Mm -hmm. And it lets people know that you can have a, perhaps could have a conversation with them, looking people in the eye. And we have all spent so much time in the past couple of years with our masks on, not making eye contact as if we could catch a virus by looking someone in the eye. <laughs> and that doesn't happen. Make people feel significant by looking them in the eye. It's interesting. Um, Walmart and I think the Four Seasons Hotel or the Ritz Carlton Hotel and Disney practice this one technique that they call the 10 5 way. And that is if you're walking towards someone, a picture someone on the manufacturing floor, you, if you're walking towards them and if you're within 10 feet, they encourage you at Disney and the Ritz Carlton to look up and make eye contact. And if you're within five feet of that person, smile and say, hi. They noticed when they practiced this at the Ochsner Medical Center in Southwestern Louisiana, they found that they got higher approval ratings from their patients and better, uh, better uh, reviews on mm -hmm. their social media, simply by looking people in the eye and saying, hi, I doesn't see take any confidence. I see you. Yeah. I see yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. You have the confidence look at me in the eye. And I just think that listeners are going to be, are going to be thinking the same question I'm asking. Is there some, like when you look someone in the eye, should you be looking away after a certain amount of time or when does it get weird? Yeah. Yes. It gets weird after about 60% of the time okay. you look someone in the eye and then you're having a conversation. You'll look away as you think you might put your thumb on your chin as you're thinking about what you're going to say. Then you come back and you say a little bit more. Yeah. Then you might glance in the other direction. You use your hands to yeah. show expression 60 to 65% yeah. of the time. And again, yeah. Practice with people you Practice. know, because yeah. every, everybody wants to get that. Most everybody, in my experience, wants to improve in these areas of confident communication. And just for those out there, and, and I've really worked on this, I don't see people as confident when they're talking to me or I'm talking to them and they're looking on their phone. <laughs> so yeah, definitely the eye contact is going to be a step up because the phone does not draw confidence. So this is just a little sample, folks. <laughs> Tracy, if we want to continue to work on our skills, we want some reminders, and I'll leave this in the show notes, but, but how do people uh, learn more from you? They can go to our website, which is confidenceproject.com. They can reach out to me at info at confidenceproject.com. And then I'm on Instagram, the confidence underscore project. And I'm not on Facebook. I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> Happy to look you up, look me up on LinkedIn. And I would love for people to have a chance to get my book, The Now Hello, What to Say in the World of Work. Awesome. Well, I'm going to re-listen to this podcast and see how I can improve my speech and my confidence. And I've already learned uh, so many different tips just through here, Tracy. Thanks for taking the time. And uh, I'm excited for the feedback and all the links will be in the show notes. And let's be more confident together with practice. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you, Trevor. Hey, folks, appreciate you taking the time to join us today. If you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone. Haven't subscribed yet? Do it now. Remember, if you want results, the key is increasing your awareness of how you show up.